Hello and welcome back to PA Chalk Up. I'm your host Manny and today we have Tim. Hi Tim, how are we doing? We're doing well, thank you. Now, I will pre-, pre-, pre tell people this. We have previously filmed this. A fall on my end happened and we weren't able to get out. So Tim has been nice enough to come back on and talk about everything again. So appreciate you Tim for that as well. Yeah, no worries, it happens. Technology is um, great until it doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Like, the amount of times that I've had to have people come back on is crazy, but I still prefer this to Zoom or Teams. The time I spent on Zoom and Teams drove me nuts. So hopefully everything's good this time around. Uh, but if you let everyone know who you are, what you do, and how you got to where you are. Sure. Uh, currently an associate professor and the director of the Sports Science Master's Program at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, prior to uh, coming to Pitt, so I've been here now a little over three months, um, about three months. And prior to this, I was at Carroll University in Waukesha, Wisconsin, a small liberal arts school, and I was there for eight years. And uh, I was the director of the uh, sport physiology and performance coaching program there as well, and master's program. And, um, you know, variety of different things that we're doing right now is obviously combining strength and conditioning sports science uh, within our masters. And um, obviously the research that we've been doing recently has been very strength power oriented. Uh, so focused on things like weightlifting derivatives, their, uh, those movements, as well as uh, accentuated eccentric loading, eccentric training, and it, pretty much anything strength and power related uh, we're interested in. And then obviously, uh, with all the data that we collect here with our athletes, we're doing a lot of um, retrospective analyses uh, with our graduate students uh, on the athlete monitoring data that we're collecting. So a lot of force plate data, a lot of GPS data. Um, there's there's a lot of things that we're going to be doing here. As a strat coach and a business owner, my time is quite limited. My favorite part about being a coach is the fact that I get to interact with athletes and be with athletes and really coach them. That's why I use Team Builder. I remember the days of searching for exercises, manually typing them in, and spending hours on spreadsheets and organizing my programs. This tends to be quite tedious and a lot of time consuming, which meant that I wasn't able to coach as much. So now for my business, Team Builder is a non-negotiable. It's an all-in-one programming platform that lets you create and deliver workouts to your athletes just in a few clicks. With Team Builder, I can customize programs, track athletes' progress in real time, and generate performance reports. My athletes get full ownership of their progress and can even share feedback on how they felt the sessions going. Having this in place actually gives me more time to coach and be with my athletes. If you're ready to take your next step in your program and give more time to your athletes, head over to teambuilder.com and use promo code PACHALKUP, that's P-A-C-H-A-L-Q-U-P, and start your 30-day free trial. Perfect. And with the strata power element of research that you do, with the derivatives, what are some of the the information that's came out from that and how is it applicable to the field that you found a link to? Well, I think we just made this podcast about three hours longer because that's about how long it's going to take for me to get through that. Um, hey, I've got hey, time for you. you know, I've got all the time for you. Yeah. Um, we've had, uh, so the the process of the, the weightlifting derivatives kind of started um, Paul Comfort was one of the first ones who was doing some of the pulling derivative research. So just for the listeners, a, um, there's weightlifting movements, which are going to be your snatch and clean and jerk. And then there's uh, derivatives of those that are just modifications of the, the competition lifts. So we can break the clean and jerk into clean variations and jerk variations, uh, but also what we would call overhead uh, pressing derivatives, um, kind of stemming from the original pressing exercise, but then there's weightlifting catching derivatives that are going to modify either the starting position or the catching position. So like a clean versus a power clean versus a mid thigh power clean or a hang clean. So these are all catching variations. 
obviously you could add the snatch in, in front of the, or instead of clean and all of those. But then we have weightlifting pulling derivatives, which are going to omit the catch phase completely. So you have things like pulls from the floor, hang pulls, counter movement shrugs, jump shrugs, hang high pulls. Um, and a lot of that stemmed from uh, uh, Paul's, some, some of Paul's original studies, he was comparing a mid-thigh pull with a, um, a mid-thigh power clean, mid-thigh clean, and then all of those were done at the same load. During my thesis project, this was during um, 2011, 2012, and then we started publishing that a little bit thereafter, was comparing um, the jump shrug, the hang high pull with the hang power clean uh, across a spectrum of loads. So we kind of expanded on what Paul was doing um, and then kind of looked how um, how the load was going to, the exercise and load combination kind of modified the stimulus a little bit. Um, because we were looking at, you know, distinct or instantaneous variables such as peak force, peak power, uh, peak velocity, we expanded that out and then started looking at um, the overall force time curve itself to see if they were going to differ between the exercises and the loads. Um, and we did find that uh, when looking at a jump shrug compared to uh, a hang high pull and a hang power clean, that the force time curve was very unique. Um, the counter movement and everything was the same because they started from the same position, went down to the knee, transitioned back. But then the second pull phase, or in this case, the jump itself, uh, showed a very peaked um, force time curve compared to the other two. And so uh, this was followed up by research by Christoph Kipp. Um, and basically we found that 85% of the movement itself when time normalized were the same. They were really identical, but that last 10 to 15% was very unique uh, in terms of the actual uh, propulsion of that movement. Mm -hmm. So we then expanded upon that because um, we, you know, we started looking at different exercises and things like that. And so Paul and I actually submitted a grant to the, the NSCA to actually do a training study. This was uh, the international collaboration grant uh, a while back uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but uh, the whole purpose of the study was to compare um, catching variations compared to training with pulling variations that were biomechanically similar. So this was eight weeks of training. And um, so one group went through and did every single time they had a, um, a catching or a weightlifting movement, they would perform a catch phase. So it was a power clean from the floor or a mid thigh power clean. And uh, this was two different blocks where they did sets of five or sets of three. Um, this was in season with uh, some of the athletes that, uh, that Paul had used. And then what we ended up finding was that there were both groups improved. So they improved their power output, their jump height, their isometric mid thigh pole, peak force, et cetera, their strength. Um, but there was no difference between the groups. So the take home message of that original research was that uh, it's not do one or the other. It's that you can do either and get a very similar training effect when the loads were identical. So that's a part that I missed just describing mm -hmm. there, but um, the exercises, whether it's a power clean from the floor or a pull from the floor were performed with the exact same load. So as a result, uh, we kind of identified the gray area um, that kind of existed from a training stimulus standpoint that it didn't matter what uh, exercise and load combination we used that you could use pulling variations and you could use catching variations and get the exact same training effect based on the metrics that we looked at. So because we have the potential with pulling derivatives to load beyond someone's 1RM clean or snatch uh, because they're not catching the bar, but we can also introduce variations that have um, really light loads that we can get a max effort from and are a bit more ballistic in nature, like your jump shrug and hang high pull. Um, we can either get higher forces due to heavier loads, or we can get higher velocities that we may not be able to achieve um, with catching variations. So if you can kind of think of it as an, an overload stimulus for from the force and velocity end of the spectrum. So we expanded upon um, Paul's study, and I, I ran this study at, uh, at Carroll, 
that we had three different groups. So group one and group two were very similar to um, Paul's study in that uh, you had the same exact loading. One group did catching, one group did biomechanically similar pulling. But then we added a third group that, as I described, used phase specific loading so that we could emphasize either the force component or the velocity component, depending on the goals that the individual had. Uh, and, and what we ended up finding with that, so this was done 10 weeks of training and just for context, both polling groups did not, these are all clean variations, um, both polling groups did not catch for 10 weeks. They did not front squat for 10 weeks. The only time they were in a front rack position was when they were doing um, either like a push press or a jerk variation uh, mm -hmm. as part of their training program. And they also did, you know, they were squatting, they were doing upper body movements, they were, um, you know, push pull, uh, you know, rowing variations, you know, all of, all of these things just to make it a very well-rounded and um, ecologically yeah, program. valid program. Um, so we measured everything could possibly think of. So they did a 1RM power clean prior to the study, post-study. They did ISO pulls. They did um, short sprints, 10, 20, and 30 meters. They did a 505 change of direction on both legs. They did squat jumps. They did counter movement jumps. I mean, with several different loads. So you name it, we, we measured it. We also looked at some muscle architecture in both the vastus lateralis uh, as well as the biceps femoris muscle. Uh, what we ended up seeing uh, cumulatively kind of across that is that the overload group, and I'm just going to use the 1RM power clean as an example, the overload group on average improved uh, from a relative standpoint 8% uh, over the course of 10 weeks. Wow. So just for context, the catch group and the pulling group maybe improved about 4% on average. And there were some people within the pull and the overload group that actually decreased their performance. It wasn't by much, but they, but they did decrease their performance. Um, for context, the heaviest loads that the overload group used were about 135% of their 1RM power clean during mid-thigh pulls. And then the heaviest loads that the catch group did uh, during their power cleans or uh, hang cleans, I can't remember which exercise, I think it was power cleans, was 82.5% for five, which was very difficult. Wow. Um, so just for context, you can obviously improve your 1RM using submaximal loads, but you can improve it more when you can introduce super maximal loads that they may not have used previously. Now I use that example because just as a reminder, the individuals in that group and all in all groups did not front squat the entire time. And they didn't in the overload group and pull group didn't catch a clean for 10 weeks. So, mm. and this was training three times a week. It just goes to show that you're training a similar movement, number one. Um, but two, when you expose the individual to different positions and you know, still performing that second pull movement, they can still improve their clean without actually cleaning. Yeah. I really like that you measured every variable instead of controlling every variable. I think that says a lot to, again, I've met you and Paul, so I kind of know what you use value in terms of research and then the application that you can get from it. So controlling a variable is very different from what you do because like, again, my biggest pet peeve in, um, in reading research is like when I go down to the methods section and they try and control or eliminate every variable that could happen in a performance setting. Can you sort of just guide us on your thought process behind that and why you've measured every, cause like, again, you have to account for all this data. You have to then analyze it and then make sense of it. So that's a lot of extra work. So why is that important as opposed to controlling it for you guys? So uh, the other thing I'll mention about Paul's research and my research is these are non weightlifters. So these are individuals who don't compete in weightlifting. They're more kind of your typical team sport type athlete or individual sport athlete that is going to be 
performing, you know, change direction movements, they're going to jump, they're going to sprint. So the idea was that we measured all these things because we want to see not only, you know, if you train a movement, is it going to get better? They obviously used weightlifting movements, they got stronger, you know, they squatted, they pro you know, they got stronger over the course of the study, uh, which directly uh, relates to weightlifting performance. But we wanted to see if the transfer uh, mm -hmm. of those movements actually move towards other skills. Now, we did not have them on a sprinting program. We did not have them on a change of direction program. So it was only resistance training three times a week. You could probably, maybe, um, you could po possibly see even better improvements if you added those things into what we did, primarily due to the fact that they are using that skill specific strength um, force production characteristics and mm -hmm. you know actually sprinting actually changing direction um, because those things in itself are skills and they need to be practiced so what we ended up finding was that uh, again with the overload group that we saw you know people were people were jumping higher but why were they jumping higher? So measuring these on a force plate, we could see that their propulsive force was a lot higher than it was mm. previously due to the fact that they, you know, they took the time within the training program to train to generate a much larger impulse. So larger forces over a shorter period of time. Um, we also saw that with the pull group, that was pretty unique that we saw, you know, higher velocities because if you think about it, they're using super or sorry, sub maximal loads, basically the entire time with uh, pulling derivatives, uh, they, they, you know, can, in comparison to the, the overload group. But, you know, we, we wanted to look at it to see primarily, and this is a long winded answer to your question, I apologize. Um, no, it's all good. Take your time. We wanted to see if uh, the improvements of someone's strength characteristics and performing these movements if it's going to transfer to other skills yeah so that that's actually my next question is with the eight percent increase in the the tests that you did how was that then how was that then sort of applied into their performance as an athlete sure um we, we basically show that you can improve dynamic strength, isometric strength, and from a skill standpoint, we're giving them the foundation of, you know, if you want to run faster, we know that you can run faster just doing this, but it kind of laid the foundation and mentioning the fact that if we were to combine these with actual skill practice, that it's going to improve it even more. Um, but we also, the, you know, the general conclusions were if you're going to use weightlifting movements in training, it's not saying only do pulls or mm -hmm. only do or don't do catches. And I, I challenge anyone to read Paul's research or my research that says don't catch because it doesn't say that. Um, it, what it does say is that we should be using exercise and load combinations that are specific to the goals of each individual phase because there's a time and a place to catch. There's a time and a place to perform pulls based on what they're capable of doing but it also says that if you don't want to catch that's okay too because you can get a mm. really good training stimulus yeah it all goes back to that macro meso micro cycle where you're obviously going to consider the different specific needs through like a, say a year long program like you'll need some strength power endurance speed cod in there but then it's sort of like mixing and matching when those specific phases are required right yeah and you kind of spoke about the overloading systems a little bit and again i'm going to put this video up because we have previously spoke about this and it's that's like overloading the cns in a way that's so like in, instead of doing below one a hundred percent you're doing like 110 15 120 and it's what are the benefits that you found behind that and why is that important to do as well as your normal under 100 percent? yeah i mean now provided the fact that the individual is capable of doing it uh, we yeah. want to be able to stress the nervous system to kind of provide a stimulus that they may not have 
received or felt previously. So the purpose of that study um, back 10 years ago now was a, a potentiation study. So we wanted to see following really heavy partial movements. So in this case, it was a, a half squat from a 90 degree knee angle off the pins. We wanted to see if that was going to transfer to a squat jump, um, ice, you know, a um, static jump from 90 degrees as well. And the, the reality is, uh, from a potentiation standpoint, is at least from what I've found, is that it, the movement needs to be very specific, one transferring to the other, but two, um, it should stress the nervous system to kind of recruit those higher end motor units that we may not necessarily have achieved previously, and then see if those can actually hang on to a subsequent task or into a subsequent task. So in this case, I, ball, uh, this is what they were using. It was 90% for a double, of their one uh, RM half squat from the pins. So it was not light, it was very heavy. And actually, if, if we went through and actually did the calculations, it was still a super maximal load um, compared to what their, their parallel squat was um, for each individual. So as a result of that, um, you know, they may walk out of there and I ask them to do a squat jump within 15 seconds. Some of them are gonna jump through the roof some of them are going to tank because they're just, their body isn't necessarily, you know, that we generate both fatigue and potentiation on a spectrum. Um, their body may not be ready for it yet, but to your point, why do we want to use those things? It's because, um, we're trying to expand the loading spectrum for an individual. And we can't do that if we're always loading submaximally. Um, there's some really good mm -hmm. research out there to suggest that doing you know, full, uh, full range of motion squats paired with partial squats would actually give you a better benefit than just doing full squats alone. Obviously, you know, it has to be within a certain time period of the year. You're probably going to sacrifice some volume with the full squats so that you can use the, uh, the partials as well. But um, yeah, I, that's, it, it just exposes an individual to some a training stimulus that they may not have felt or used before. Yeah. So it's kind of going to that again, pop and it's that neural prep for what's to potentially come in future performances. And like off the end of that, we then have to talk about like the breaking forces that happen. So that's when your eccentrics come into it and you do a lot of research in eccentrics as well. How, do you pair both and like what has your research led to to dabble in both of them yeah we're so a good chunk of our research right now is focused on accentuated eccentric loading so for listeners that is a movement that's going to pair uh the uh, the eccentric and concentric movement um normal movement mechanics but it also what's unique about it is that you have a heavier load eccentrically than you do concentrically. Um, now that's typically done via weight releasers that would be on the outside of, um, uh, on the barbell, but, uh, you may use dumbbells if you're holding on to them, um, you know, and dropping them at the bottom of a counter movement jump or something like that. What we're finding, um, is we're doing a, a several different things right now, but, uh, the first paper that we had out and the one that we have in review right now uh, used both men and women. Um, we used traditional squats versus um, maximally loaded AEL, which means their first repetition of the squat was performed with their 1RM. Uh, but we also looked at super maximal with 110%. Uh, there are individuals that go on to like 120%. Um, I will tell you, like you're, you may be capable of doing that, but doing multiple sets of it is going to be really challenging, especially if you reload the hooks. Um, but anyway, what we're finding is, uh, we're comparing the differences between, uh, how much load needs to come off and can it be, um, can it be beneficial from the propulsion standpoint if, um, you know, instead of just the breaking phase. So both studies with men and women, what we found is that the breaking phase was enhanced when you're using a heavier load, which isn't groundbreaking. Um, but what we did also learn from it is that 
we perform the squats with 50, 60, 70, and 80% of their one RM on the way up. So Mm -hmm. we're learning how much weight needs to fall off in order to get a a certain training stimulus. And uh, our conclusions were that um, a greater amount of weight that falls off, so let's just say 100% on the way down, 50 on the way up, will be a greater stimulus for rate of force development from the braking side of things compared to if I had 100 on the way down and 80 on the way up is going to be more of a strength type stimulus and more your peak force stimulus. Um, Now, anyone who's ever done AEL will tell you that when only a little weight falls off, it's still very challenging. Um, You know, and you don't need like we, we did sets that they did 110% on the way down and 80 on the way up. And um, it was only the first repetition that they used the hooks. But I'd tell you by rep three of that set, it's hard. Um, Mm. But uh, we found that with both the men and the women. Uh, I'm working on uh, the third paper of um, of that project. And what we did is similar to the potentiation stuff that we uh, were talking about previously is not everybody has the same benefits uh, from that. So stronger people versus weaker people may actually uh, respond a little bit differently because AEL is also um, has this idea of within set potentiation. So we use the first repetition to benefit the subsequent, you know, concentric phase and maybe the subsequent repetitions as well. The original work the by John Waggle a little uh, is back during his dissertation, so like 2018, 19, 20, when he was publishing that. Um, what he ended up finding was that it, by using the hooks, the weight releasers on rep one, it actually carries over into reps two and three. Um, obviously, if you reload the hooks, you're going to get that eccentric stimulus each time. But um, even if you just use the hooks on rep one, you can benefit reps two and three. Is that with the fatigue mechanism at play there? Uh, it, it could be. Um, it could be. You know, the, again, I don't know, I, you know, on average, that's what they saw. But I don't know that they did a comparison with stronger and weaker people to see mm-hmm. um, how it benefited them. But they, they ended up doing a kind of a rep by rep analysis. And uh, we're able to see that by, uh, they did sets of five, but um, first rep enhanced from eccentric rate of force development, reps two and three eccentric rate of force development still elevated, but by rep four and five, it was back to baseline. So Mm -hmm. that has to do, I'm sure, with the, the fatigue that was accumulating throughout that set. I'm not surprised. Um, it's kind of like any set that we do. You see a, you know, a decrease in velocity yeah. the more reps you do, like that type of thing. Um, but we're kind of we followed up that those studies with um, a comparison of the three different conditions: so traditional, maximal AEL, super maximal AEL. Comparing between those who could squat double body weight for those that against those that couldn't. Um, and I think what we ended up with was the average squat of the of the stronger group was something like 2.2 or 2.3 um, times their body weight versus the other group was like 1.7, which isn't weak by any means. Um, you know, it's just not, you know, that, uh, that level that we ended up doing a comparison with. What was really interesting about this, and I need to write faster um, to, so I can get this out <laughs> um, and the, and need to stop doing other projects, but um what we ended up finding is we looked at braking and propulsion, um, mean force, duration, and impulse of, of all, those, uh, all those repetitions, the average, and across the loading spectrum of 50, 60, 70, 80. And we ended up finding that from a traditional squat standpoint, so no weight releasers, they actually, there was no difference in any variable except propulsion duration, where it was shorter with the stronger individuals, which basically means that the indi- the stronger individuals were able to perform the propulsion phase faster on average. Not surprising. Um, but no difference in braking, no difference in really propulsion. But what was interesting was that once we added in the weight releasers, 
then we started seeing significant differences in how they perform the braking phases across the loading spectrum. And uh, with the super maximal loads as well, we also saw um, improvements in the propulsion phase in the stronger group, whereas the weaker group had really no change. So as a take home, stronger individuals are able to use AEL to achieve a greater braking stimulus and then carry that over into the propulsion side of things with squats uh, to a greater extent compared to weaker individuals. Now that follows the research on um, typical potentiation where stronger individuals get a better training stimulus. But this is primarily the reason why myself and others have classified AEL as very much an advanced training strategy. You know, we know that it can work, but we're still trying to answer a lot of questions of how to implement mm -hmm. it. So myself, Chris Tabor, um, handful of others who are doing this type of research, you know, that's ultimately the goal. Um, and it, you know, it's how much load, what should the eccentric duration be? Uh, how frequently should we do it? Um, who should use it? You know, these are all different questions that need to be answered. So we're still, we're still kind of grazing the surface to be honest. Yeah. Can you just describe a little bit of AEL and what some descriptions of it is? Sure. Um, AEL, Again, accentuated eccentric loading. Uh, I mentioned that there's three characteristics it has to have. Um, the heavier load during the eccentric phase compared to the concentric, pairing eccentric and concentric muscle actions, um, but also using a minimal disruption to their natural movement mechanics. What's really unique about AEL is that you can use super maximal loads that we were talking about. So in our case, 110%. You can use maximal loads. But you can also use submaximal loads um, all the way down to low percentages of body weight. So some of the um, some of the seminal studies, the first studies uh, on submaximal stuff were done with jumps with uh, Jeremy Shepard's work back in I think uh, 2007, 2008, and um, he was doing AEL jumps, uh, dumbbell jumps with. Um, or jumps in general. I'm not sure if they were dumbbells or not, but with uh, elite volleyball players. And what they ended up showing acutely and chronically is that they were able to improve their power output, jump height, you know, explosive ability with individuals who need to be able to jump explosively. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest of the research since then has been very unique in that it's been looking at what percentage of their uh, body weight is going to give like the best training stimulus. And a lot of people agree that's roughly about 20% of their body weight. Um, we're doing a study right now. We're finishing data collection. I think we have all the men, but we're finishing up data collection with the women, um, looking at 10, 20, 30% body weight, as well as 10, 20, 30% of, uh, their back squat one RM, which hasn't been used before. So, um, we're, we should be able to do a strength comparison with that as well. And I, I think I know what we're going to find with it. I think the listeners would know what we're going to find. But um, yeah, the different definitions is that we have AEL with submaximal loads really light. We have super maximal loads that can be really heavy. Um, what I will tell you AEL is not is uh, AEL and flywheel are not the same thing. So flywheel training um, generally uses a closed system. Now we're talking about um, non-motorized flywheel, so not extra fly with the, with the motor. Mm -hmm. But um, if we have an individual with their harness, they push up and they receive that stimulus coming down, that is a closed system. So the impulse you generate is the impulse you have to accept. That is not AEL. Um, now. Another thing that is not AEL is um, it's, it's related, I will say that, but uh, what we call accelerated eccentrics, which were kind of coined by um, John Hughes, Matt Hanford, and uh, Tommy Bright uh, in the UK, that are um, accelerated eccentrics are those that are really trying to emphasize the speed of the braking phase. So using bands, for example, 
to do a counter movement jump. So bands are going to accelerate you down into that counter movement or the, the downward phase, the breaking phase. So you're going to get a very peaked um, impulse during that, uh, during that breaking phase. And it's all, uh, an accelerated eccentric is also going to be something like a drop catch. So holding on mm -hmm. to a hex bar and you accelerate downward and stop yourself before uh, the weights would hit the floor. Can you obviously do that with a bench press, even a squat, um, you know, with lighter loads. But um, you can see that there's very much a spectrum of eccentrics. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, how we classify them. And that's something that we're working on as well. I've previously had the CEO of Eccentric on talking about, we were talking about how it started and um, the development of it. And something that i wasn't as aware of at the time was obviously as much as you put in is what you get out now what he introduced to me at that point was that you can actually so you know have you seen those lifts where people have the safety squat and they've got their hands on the rack and they're doing sort of like um they're pushing themselves up to be able to overload the the bar mm -hmm. He's saying that he can, you can do that as well with the K box, and what you're pushing up is then what's going to get put down. So that would be more than like you are able to do yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, there was um, there was one paper that was published within the last couple years in a strength and conditioning journal that was talking about actually providing an overload. Now, in this case, overload is higher eccentric forces or other variables compared to concentric. Um, you're perfectly capable of doing that in the way that you described, but they also mentioned, um, you know, performing the concentric phase with two limbs and then accepting it on one. Mm -hmm. That's another method of, of okay. eccentric training in general, just called a two one method. Um, they also talked about changing the range of motion. So if I do a full squat from the bottom and accelerate all the way upwards, and then I accept that external uh, or the eccentric forces in a quarter squat, it's obviously going to be a very large impulse over a short period of time, um, making it very peaked. So they, they talked about that in, the, in, the, um, in that paper. And off the top of my head, I cannot remember who wrote it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very unique, um, very unique paper that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think when people talk about flywheel training, um, it's certainly, you're certainly able to do it as long as you, uh, understand how to actually do mm -hmm. it. So the author, I just happened to look it up. It was published this year. Um, the last name is Martinez Hernandez. And um, David Martinez Hernandez, and um, you know that was in the Strength and Conditioning Journal. A you know, like I said, it's, um, uh, it's definitely something that needs to be explored. I will say that the uh, you know um, the king of flywheel research right now is uh, Marco Bito, and um, you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered, and specifically things like how does flywheel training compare to other methods of training? Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's been a couple studies out there. Um, but again, it's hard to, it's hard to monitor eccentrics in general. It's really hard to monitor some of the uh, flywheel um, yeah. stuff as well. No one rep will look the same. Correct. Um, that's something that when I first got on, it's, it's different. It's a different loading system to what, people are used to now again it also depends on if you've got the harness or the belt mm -hmm. but even that like your body position to catch will be different to if you were doing a barbell squat or a dumbbell kettlebell squat it's it's unique very unique yeah definitely when we talk about sort of plyometrics and the ability to explode one thing that I took away from the Switzerland um, conference that we were both at was the the clean jump um, derivative that you introduced. Well, Paul did, but he said you you were the credit one for that. So can you break it down a little bit and um, 
sort of tie into what we spoke about previously in the weightlifting um, derivatives? Yeah, so a jump shrug is very unique in that you could probably classify it as a weightlifting pulling derivative um, because of the similar movement mechanics, uh, but you could also classify it as a loaded jump. And so what's unique about the movement in general is that compared to other loaded jumps, it obviously has a hip hinge movement, so you're less... Um, straight vertical when it comes to a counter movement because you're going to scoop the hips under um, when you perform that movement. But uh, typically you're gonna use that with really light loads as you would most uh, loaded jumps in general. Um, but it also possesses very unique um, force, uh, uh, force time and force velocity characteristics. So, um, you know, compared to our standard jumps that we think of with a, a loaded jump our hex bar jumps our jump squats we actually did a study on this and compared the jumps the jump shrug uh to those two exercises um and what we ended up finding was that the jump shrug itself uh produced higher uh it, it produced higher forces at peak power compared to the hex bar jump and the jump squat at the exact same loads. Um, however, uh, the hex bar and jump squat produced higher velocities at peak power compared to the jump shrug. So you could make the argument that a jump shrug is a more force dominant derivative. Uh, but what I will tell you is that um, as the loads get, get heavier with a jump shrug, you start to lose those characteristics a little bit, um, primarily because the hip hinge is more difficult to perform compared to a counter movement that is strictly vertical. Um, now, how this kind of fits on this spectrum of, of jumps, loaded jumps, it's, and, you know, plyometric exercises, is that you know, uh, if we're using a, a, a jump shrug compared to you know, a, a go to the extreme like a drop jump the time of the stretch shortening cycle is going to be significantly longer for, a, um, for a, a jump shrug. And that has to do with the fact of the length of time it takes to perform the hip hinge movement versus the rapid stretch shortening cycle that occurs during a drop jump. However, they do kind of fit on a spectrum of your speed strength exercises versus strength speed exercises within that context. Now, if I were comparing a jump shrug compared to something like a mid thigh pull or a counter movement shrug, um, then I would classify the jump shrug as more speed strength compared to a counter movement shrug as a strength speed exercise. So um, they all fit on this much grander uh, mm. force velocity curve that that exists. Um, so the fact of the matter is weightlifting movements are faster than your traditional resistance training movements like your squat press pull loaded jumps are going to be faster than your weightlifting movements unloaded jumps are going to be faster than loaded jumps loaded sprints faster than unloaded jumps and then unloaded sprinting is faster than you know, loaded sprinting. Loaded sprint. yep. Yeah. So again, it just becomes an entire spectrum that we can use um, as tools in our toolbox to train the athlete. I think this is a very important thing that you've brought up. And, and in the field, you can be very tied down to one specific method and one specific principle. But what you've just described is sort of going from the slowest slow that you can go. So like a heavy one RM or loaded eccentrics and then build that up to unloaded sprints. And so really using that whole force curve the way that people get tied down in these is it's kind of limiting to what their athletes can do and i think the importance that you place on this practical sense of your methodologies and your applications to your athletes do you think that neglecting everything else and just going solely focus on one that hinders your athletes more on their their whole performance i think by I mean, the, the collective research definitely suggests that we should be using a combination of, you know, one end of the spectrum versus the other end of the spectrum. Um, so in this case, we'll just say a force or velocity emphasis. Um, 
However, how we divvy that up is going to be based on, you know, again, what the, what the athlete needs. So within the needs analysis for the actual athlete, are they going to be more that strength speed person or more that speed strength person? And, you know, the percentage that we kind of modify their training with is, is, you know, is going to be unique to that individual. The problem that we often face is that individuals, um, strength and conditioning coaches, and I'm guilty of it too, uh, working with variety of athletes, you get comfortable in being able to create the same program for every single person. Now, again, we're all going to have our bread and butter exercises. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the reality the is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, 90, 90% or 80 to 90% of the programs that we develop may be used with almost any athlete that we have. However, you know, that other 10 to 20%, depending on um, the level of athlete you have, et cetera, is what's going to be very unique to that individual. Uh, because, you know, we still need to develop, we still need to develop, you know, those uh, maximal strength characteristics that serve as our underpinning, um, uh, underpinning characteristics for other abilities. I, you know, we'll say that uh, strength is the foundation upon which other abilities are built. And, you know, just ask Mike Stone, he's been doing it for years. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, when you start to add in, you know, that 10 to 20% of that other programming, it becomes very unique. And um, I think that's where you can get your, um, you, those adaptations, provided that, you do, that you've done it in a progressive manner, um, you know, building them up to what you would like them to achieve. But I what I would also say, and I, we kind of mentioned this before, is that you're not going to get better at sprinting unless you sprint. You're not mm -hmm. going to get better at changing direction until you change direction. Um, so despite focusing on these things, whether it's the weight room or, um, you know, the pitch or wherever you're working on these things, they still need to practice the skill itself. And this kind of comes down to um, each individual skill being very specific in terms of the strength characteristics that it needs. And so, you know, I define strength as the ability to produce force uh, against an external resistance within a task specific context. So the task specific context is a skill. It can be sprinting, it can be change of direction, it can be squatting, it can be a weightlifting movement, but all of those require very task-specific strength, not sport-specific strength. Task-specific strength and sport-specific strength can be very different, different. depending on yeah. uh, what we're talking about. Yeah, um, I've recently got some uh, slack at dinner based on our previous conversation about sprinting and it's linked to plyometric exercises. Mm. Um, the person I was at dinner with was very much, that is not an extension or anywhere related to plyometrics. And we, we kind of had to agree to disagree on that one. Um, but can you talk about the link between sprinting, although they are very two different exercises, but they are still linked in the terms of shortening cycle of it sure i mean i would i would first make the argument that plyometrics in general uh, the way that we think about them with the training studies and everything that are out there a lot of the and i'm putting quotes plyometrics are not actually plyometrics um they are it's mm -hmm. jump training yep. um and part of that comes down to the length of time of the actual stretch shortening cycle that takes place so there's a, there's a good paper that came out uh, earlier this year, not too long ago, that was actually going through and defining what a fast and slow stretch shortening cycle actually was. And, you know, the standard that we've been thinking about for a long time was roughly 250 milliseconds. This group actually showed that it might actually be shorter than that. Um, but anyway, uh, that, you know, as part of this conversation. Um, if it's if we consider a fast stretch shortening cycle to be you know less than that 250 milliseconds or whatever number it was, um, elite sprinting they are on the ground for about 90 milliseconds. So you can't tell me that that movement is not 
plyometric in the sense that there is a eccentric phase there is kind of the load acceptance of the amortization or isometric phase and then the propulsion phase because they're on the ground for a minimal amount of time because uh, if they're on the ground any longer they're they may actually be slowing down why uh why the transfer uh like plyometric exercises may relate to sprinting and i would again classify sprinting as a plyometric exercise just because of how short uh, the movement is there's an, again not necessarily going to be direct transfer because of the tasks that you are performing you know just because someone performs a bound really well doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be sprinting really well although mechanics are you know can be somewhat similar um but that being said you still have to perform the skill itself uh, which is actually sprinting, going through the acceleration phase, going through the transition and the max velocity phases. Um, but um, yeah, it's I, I don't think you can separate the two based mm -hmm. on the characteristics that actually um, relate with Define both it. of them. Yeah. yeah, you also brought up a good point when we were uh, talking about plyometrics and the development of power and it's the depth jump um considerations behind time under like the time it takes from you to jump off bounce and then jump up again can you describe like the the way that the height impacts um the way that we look at that as a rsi and how that sort of associates with it sure yeah the there's been some uh, a fair bit of research looking at what they would call an optimal drop height for people during drop jumps. Um, for the listeners, you know, we're we're constantly battling um, our uh, proprioceptors when it comes to um, stretch shortening cycle. So typically, you get two different signals that are going to be battling each other. Um, our muscle spindles within the muscle bellies are going to be um, telling our muscle to contract when they feel a stretch or a rapid rate of stretch. So it's kind of like if you go, when you go to the doctor's office and they do the, you know, they hit your knee for the reflex test, the reflex. you know, it's a myotactic type, type, uh, type text. Um, your knee's going to kick and it's the same as if we're going to jump or telling our muscle, yes, you need to contract so we can, so we can jump. However, depending on the height, um, we may actually, or we will be receiving an additional force stimulus that's actually going to the tendon, in this case, the Golgi tendon organs. Um, the Golgi tendon organs actually work as um, a protective mechanism where there is too, if there is too much force that's being generated or felt within the tendon itself, it sends us a signal to actually relax the muscle rather than contract the muscle. So we're constantly in this battle uh, with each individual and their reactive strength abilities is that, you know, if they're too high on a box, when they step off and land, it may generate too much force for their body to tolerate at that point um, within that short period of time. And they may actually have a longer leg on the ground. So longer ground contact time, which may subsequently also decrease their their jump height it could also increase their jump height if they stay on the ground long enough and actually accept mm -hmm. those forces and then jump but if we're talking about a drop jump where we're trying to minimize the time on the ground um those golgi tendon organs might fire and then they may tell us nope you're not going to jump that high what would be some of your advice for new coaches and coaches coming into this industry and sort of how to tie in all that we've sort of discussed today there we, we covered a lot <laughs> um yeah <laughs> but uh i mean uh, the first the first piece of advice i would have is do the basics savagely well um and you know the reality is we talked about potentiation complexes we talked about ael we talked about um kind of the spectrum of plyometrics a little bit um the reality is some of the athletes that we work with will never ever uh, need to use potentiation complexes and AEL. It, it, it's just the reality, or at least, you know, maximal, super maximal AEL. 
um, because you can accomplish quite a bit in terms of improving strength characteristics, power output by using very basic methods of training. Example, um, you know, we can use heavy resistance training, traditional, traditional loading, and just use jump training or plyometric training because anyone can, anyone can use plyometric training at different levels as long as they're uh, prepped for it. But you can improve, um, you can improve power output and their strength characteristics quite a bit just from doing those types of things. But then use that as your foundation and then start to sprinkle in the, uh, the sexier stuff like your AEL, your potentiation complexes. But again, this comes back to doing the basics savagely well uh, until you start to see the athlete needing a novel training stimulus to continue to improve. On top of that, um, I would also say don't isolate training um, to the point where they are not still practicing the actual skill. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the concepts of things like triphasic training, I understand the, the theory behind it, where you want to focus on the eccentric, you want to focus on the isometric, you want to focus on the concentric movement to emphasize the phases of training for the stretch shortening cycle. There's nothing wrong with that theory. However, what needs to be done is that you still need to practice the actual skill because otherwise it's going to become very difficult to only perform. Like you may be really good at the eccentric phase of it, but if you can't pair it with the concentric phase at all, mm -hmm. that's a problem. So um, again, the other thing I would say is um, don't chase ratios. Um, each individual has um, a specific profile. They may have a specific dynamic strength index and everything, but it's really important to put it into context and actually relate it back to their sport performance because they may have, you know, I'm making this up, but a really low dynamic strength index, which means that they need to train ballistically. But if that type of individual is at the top of their, you know, their conference mm -hmm. performance or nationally and everything that may, that profile may actually be what makes them good. So if you start, you know, uh, messing around with that, you may actually make them worse by training them a certain way. Now, again, it's a guide to, to training. As long as we put it into context, then it can be beneficial. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you've just reminded me of one point that you had when you were presenting your at the the swiss conference and it's that thing of if you don't meet those requirements you cannot do mm -hmm. a specific uh move th your your particular example was if you don't squat double your body where you can't perform plyometric exercises um speaking about that I, i'm not going to name names but previously offline i told you about this this thing that happened and that is one thing that that individual said and i was like Again, Tim is fucking right. <laughs> like this does <laughs> happen in in this industry. Well, and, and again, you know, I, I'm giving a talk in a in an upcoming uh, NSCA conference specifically on you know athlete testing ratios and force velocity profiles. But to to add context to that, the old uh, I'll say older literature recommendations have said that. For plyometrics, you sh that you have to be able to squat double body weight uh, to, in order to perform lower body plyometrics. They also said that uh, you needed to be able to bench one and a half times your body weight to do upper body plyometrics. So within that context, I, I remember at the Swiss conference, I asked the room how many people could actually do both of those. And I think between both uh, groups, I think there was five. So jokingly i said um all right so you five come with me we're gonna go do plyometrics the rest of you just sit here for the remaining hour and uh because if you do plyometrics you're going to your body's going to explode apparently so just for everyone listening when it comes to plyometrics there is a large scale uh, or spectrum of plyometrics that we can use something as simple as a line hop is not going to make someone explode. You know, it's it's very basic and you can introduce these things to really young individuals to start learning the basics of how to transition eccentric to concentric. 
What I would, however, say is that it is really important to develop their ability to tolerate their, their uh, body mass first. I mean, if you think about kids, kids are jumping off of things all mm -hmm. the time. I, you know, I have a niece and nephew and they, when they were younger, they used to jump off of furniture and, you know, land in all sorts of ways. Must be nice to not have real bones. Um, but the idea is they need to be able to stop themselves first. So introducing things at really young age, you know, hop in place, hop to one foot, hop to the other foot and stop and be able to hold that position is really important because then when you start to say, okay, we're going to hop twice, we're going to hop three times, we're going to jump from left to right to left to right. You know, these are all things that you can introduce as a progression, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, if they, you know, if they can't squat double body weight or do one and a half times bench press that they're that they cannot do plyometrics. That's simply not true. Yeah. No, I did find it fascinating because like there is a lot of like demands that people ask of their athletes. And if you can't do one thing, you can't do this. And it's, it's that whole thing where it, it all depends. Like I love the word depends because like you're never going to be able to give a yes or no answer to a complex topic like the body and exercising yeah 100 percent. yeah um i really appreciate you coming back on again tim it's uh, been a pleasure and i appreciate the the time that it's taken you to go through some of your research and how in depth and you went and providing applicable um descriptions of it as well yeah no worries happy to do it if you just let everyone know where they can find you and reach out to you. Yeah, sure. Um, on social media, on X and Instagram, uh, the handle is Dr. T. Sukumel. You can see it uh, right here. But um, uh, obviously, we have our master's program at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I should have links on either social media to our research gate page that should have all of our research available. Um, my email should be pretty easily findable, I think, when it comes to um, searching that out. But yeah, there's a research gate page. And then um, yeah, email, if you just search myself and uh, University of Pittsburgh, you should be able to find that. I'll so if you have link... questions, I'm happy to, uh, to, add or to provide them. 100%. I'll also give the link in the description to the program and where people can, can find you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tim. Peace. <laughs>